Uh, just a note on how we will present it. My name is Tom Michel and this is Nathan. So we'll basically submitted we submitted two papers and uh, first of all thank you to the conference organizers for accepting uh, one of the papers. But they also suggested that we can talk briefly about the second paper. So that's what we will do. I will present the first part and then Nathan will talk about the second paper and more generally about our research agenda on uh, uh, Health, health coverage and uh, health insurance coverage and uh, financial distress consumption, etc. Um, so, uh, because the other way around, you have upside down. Okay. So, because we are both affiliated with the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, we need to have this uh, disclaimer that these are our own views, not the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia or the Federal Reserve System. So in this paper we'll use basically this variation in uh, health insurance coverage in the US and in a minute I will explain all those details or some of the details of health insurance in the US. It's very complicated. But here we have a picture, one picture of insurance rates uh, for young adults defined as ages 19 to 25 from 2000 to 2013. And an interesting thing is actually their insurance rates are very low uh, and one of the lowest insurance rates in, among all age demographics is around 68% maybe before 2010 and then it uh, sharply increases and goes up. And what happened in 2010, the Affordable Care Act was, uh, was actually in, enacted and uh, that was a big change for many different groups but especially for young adults and this is the focus of, of this presentation. So what we found, we know from previous studies that um, there was a 50% reduction in young adult uninsurance rate after uh, 2010 and going back, uh, going to 2016 so that's after other parts of the ACA also kicked in so not only the dependent coverage mandate but also other mandates which I'll describe in a second. There was a 21% reduction in out-of-pocket costs so this is one of their like first order effects right you can have from a health, in, uh, health insurance policy and uh, of course uh, this increased coverage and reduced costs can lessen me the medical expenditure risk for this population. So research question we have in this paper is uh, did these improvements lead to reductions in financial distress? And I will define the financial distress in a, in a minute. We'll look at different measures um, uh, such as bankruptcy, uh, being late on, on their different payments, being delinquent, etc. Et so we are part of this growing literature in the US because there were so many reforms. Uh, different researchers wanted to see uh, effects of all these different mandates and reforms on, on, on financial distress. But one interesting thing is most of these uh, policies, they, are, they rely on Medicaid, which is uh, public health insurance in the US, and they also use data after 2014. And in this paper, we first to look at, at the dependent coverage mandate on financial distress of young adults. And I think they are interesting because First, you may think that they don't have so much health expenditure risk or because they are healthier than other populations on average. But then they are also financially, dis uh, financially constrained in many ways. They don't have high income, they, are, they have a lot of debt and so on, so maybe even a small shock can lead to big problems for them. So what we do in this paper, we use individual level uh, data from Credit Bureau. And we employ a very simple difference in difference design based on the specifics of the policy, which I will uh, describe in a second. Uh, our estimates are intent to treat, and we can't observe individual insurance decisions, but we can observe just like the effect on all people. So, and preview of the results, just in case I will not be able to get to them, hopefully not, but we find that across many measures of financial distress, there is a reduction in, in, uh, in those occurrences. So, for example, one of the like major, um, being major delinquent, 90 days past due on all accounts or revolving accounts, it declines by 4%. Uh, we find similar magnitudes for 120 days past due, uh, being in collection or charge off, which are major derogatory events, bankruptcy and so on. Inter 
interestingly, we have a lot of heterogeneity in, uh, among different groups, and especially we see big, biggest improvements among those populations which had higher uninsurance rate before, consistent with, with uh, what you would expect, where this uh, policy should actually affect people. And then we also find a lot of heterogeneity on, like, in terms of which particular expenses are affected. It's like really large expenses, out-of-pocket expenses. Um, an interesting feature is because of this mandate, uh, it actually works in this way that after age 26, uh, people are disenrolled. So we have this effect of first enrolling people into healthcare in insurance and then disenrolling them after one or two years. So we can see this long run effect of being not eligible for this protection anymore. So the background, and I will briefly talk about this because the law is really complicated and we don't use most part of it, but just because of this audience, maybe you don't know anything about the Affordable Care Act or health insurance uh, in the US. So basically, health insurance in the US is offered by both private and public sector, and private sector offers 55 to 60% of insurance uh, in this uh, age of less than 65 uh, through employers, okay? And public sector, you have Medicaid for low-income people, and you have Medicare for those who are older than 65, so basically for the elderly. Uh, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, or ACA, was uh, signed to law in March 2010, and what it did, it was the major reform of the health uh, care system and health insurance system in the US. Uh, major provisions took effect after 2014, and I should say that we look uh, at all the effects until 2014. So we end our sample in 2013 just in order to isolate the effect from the dependent coverage mandate from all these other policies uh, which were used. So one thing which happened after 2014, it was there, is a, there was an expansion in Medicaid. Uh, which was used by other papers. There was also individuals were mandated to have health insurance, which is called individual mandate. So there were penalties, and uh, state level health insurance exchanges were introduced so that people can shop for insurance, and also they can compare different insurance plans and so on and so forth. And finally, there was this introduction of guaranteed issue and community rating in individual insurance markets. So it's really complicated. There are many features, we will not use any of them, but this is just to explain what is going on. It's really complex. So what we will use is a dependent coverage mandate. This is just one part. Basically what it required, it required health insurance plans to provide uh, dependent coverage policies for all the children up to age 26. So if you have parents, if you are under age 26 and you have parents with health insurance, then parents could add this dependence to their health insurance plan. Uh, unlike some other components, this was an expansion in private insurance, right? So this is provided by employers, through employers, to, to these older people who can cover their dependents. It was enacted in March 10 and implemented in September 2010, and uh, interestingly for our purposes is the Department of Health and Human Services asked insurance companies to implement these policies even before they were formally required to do it in September. So, Many insurance plans, they roll, roll it out uh, when they could, and it was actually before September 2010. The mandate made the coverage for young adults until age 26 uniform across all states. So before, there was a lot of variation depending on different status, being student, being married or not married. Now it was uniform. And we know from other studies that there was uh, this first order effect. Many more people, young adults, were actually joined, uh, you know, insurance coverage, and uh, that increased by around 2 million by the end of 2011. So first, we wanted to look at one of the basic things, which is uh, out-of-pocket expenses, and we use uh, data from something called MAPS, Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, which is from uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So here we look at this, it's a, it's a survey, uh, and it's like a two-year rotating panel with approximately 15,000 individuals per panel, and so you have about 30,000 uh, respondents, colle uh, respondents collected per year. So what we do is very simple means, this is not like even a regression, and we just want to see if out-of-pocket medical expenditure changed after the mandate implementation. We'll look at two groups, uh, what we call treated, those who were born in uh, 85 to 89, 
and they were young enough to be still eligible to be covered in 2010 when the mandate fir was first enacted, implemented. And those born in 80 to 83, they would be kind of controlled, so they were old enough, but still not too old, so they can be compared to this group uh, when the mandate was implemented. So these are two graphs, very simple means, and because this is annual data, we can't do like real, you know, uh, March 2010, September 2010, this is just based on years. Just to clarify, since yeah. it's critical and MEPS has this, this is, the, the, I assume you're looking at payments, not charges, because it's massively different in the US. When you say expenditures, if you look at charges, that's a fictitious number. Then, then, there's, then MEPS, unlike NEMIS, tells you what the actual payments were, and I'm assuming that's what you're looking at. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the, the variable in, for out-of-pocket expenditures or the uh, expenditures paid by uh, yourself. Oh, that's, okay. Right, got your, got your fit. okay. Yeah, so, and here we have just two graphs. There are more gra graphs in, in this paper in the next version, not in this version. But basically, on, on the left, you have one graph, and there are two lines. So the blue line is what I define as treated, and uh, the red line is what I define as control. So you can see that uh, the trend more or less the same before 2010, and then there is some separation in terms of just average out-of-pocket uh, medical expenditures. And uh, the figure on the right is uh, this, you know, really high expenditures, which we define as more than $2,000, and the percent of people with this large expenditure. So again, it's pretty large. To me, it was kind of surprising to have 4% of these young people who are relatively healthy to have it. Uh, per year, and then you can see that uh, while the control group is going up after the reform, the uh, blue group, which is treated, is not going up so much, so there is some separation after the reform. So this is just first order effects uh, on medical, uh, medical out-of-pocket out of expenses. So uh, let me briefly, very briefly, talk about the conceptual framework which we are thinking about in this paper and how does a provision of health insurance may reduce financial distress. So first, there may be a very direct effect. You can increase uh, insurance coverage, which means that uh, if something happens, people will be covered, so their expenses are covered now, they don't have to pay them, right? Uh, and then they will have less financial distress because of this lower um, medic unpaid medical bills. Then you can have income effects where now, health insurance covers out-of-pocket costs, or a fraction of them, and then this may allow people to have more income to pay other types of debts and avoid delinquency or bankruptcy or other things uh, there, so they have more income. And then you may have risk effect, and this will be even more important for the second uh, part of the presentation, which Nathan will present. Uh, hopefully, so basically, risk effect is, it works as follows, so if you receive coverage, that may reduce the risk of medical expenditures in the future, right? Uh, so that may allow you to have less in a savings in this rainy day fund so that you can spend it on paying debt or consumption or something else. We can't separate uh, all this mechanism, but we can test the overall effect. And they all point in the same direction. So research design, as I said, is very simple, different div. Um, Framework, uh, we use people who are under age of 26 in 2010 as our treatment group and individuals older than 26 in 2010 as our control group. Uh, a few challenges, we know from prior studies that very young adults are dissimilar to older young adults in regards to of credit variables. Uh, so if you look at people who are really young and have credit cards, they are really very special people, those who are 18 or 19. And we would need that data too because our sample is, is longer, so it goes from 2008 to 2013. So that's one challenge. And the second, second is if we, so the second methodology possible is that defining treatment sta status by age, uh, but then you have this problem of people aging in and out of coverage. So every year some, somebody will age out. So what we do instead, we define treatment and control groups by birth year uh, forward. So what it means is like the same thing as I described before, but it's a bit tighter <coughs> here. So we define treated as those born in 85 and 86, and they were age 24 and 25 at the time of enactment. 
and those control uh, control would be those born in 82 and 83 they would be age 27 and 28 at the time of enactment we omitted 26 age 26 and 10 just because for them it's unclear where they would fall and we only know year of birth not the exact date in those data unfortunately so it's possible that some insurance companies they will still cover them for some time while others wouldn't cover so because it's messy we decided to exclude them uh, as I said, we can't observe insurance status, so it's all intact to treat estimates. We use uh, the New York Federal Reserve Fax Consumer Credit Panel, CCP, data, which is a 5% random sample of U.S. consumers with credit bureau files. It's individual level panel data, uh, which is completely anonymized, quarterly frequency. We can observe uh, year of birth and location of residence but, and all of those credit variables, but we have no information on income, demographics, assets. So it's, it's kind of rich on one side, but really poor on all other sides, only credit variables. So what we do, uh, we construct a set of consumers born in those years, and uh, we'll look at the sample from Q1 2008, so before the adoption of the law, until Q4 2013, this is the last uh, period before all other provisions of the ACA kicked in. Uh, and we, we have around 440,000 individuals, which is approximately 9 million observations in this sample. So first, let me, uh, oh, and panel, and one, one other thing, panel is in balance because people may enter and leave uh, this data set. Enter because they establish connection to, to, to credit, and then they may leave because of immigration or being inactive in credit and so on. So we capture them only when they, they attach to credit. So I, we utilize multiple measures of financial distress, and I will define them as we go along. So first, uh, let me just present very simple graphs of uh, averages. And again, blue line is treatment, red line is control. Uh, the graph on the left is the amount of debt in third party collections. So what is third party collections? Basically, if somebody doesn't pay their bills, for example, medical bills, those bills are sent to collectors, and those people, they start coming after this uh, individuals and trying to get money out of them. So it's very annoying, uh, but that's what, what is happening. And this is amount. So you can see that before the law was enacted and implemented, more or less parallel trends in both groups, and then uh, then there is this cross, right? So people in the treatment group, they go, their uh, amount in third party collections goes below the amount of third party collections in the control group. The figure on the right is number of major derogatory events and revolving accounts, so this would, would involve first party collections, so then the lender itself tries to, you know, collect money on this individual charge off, so like bad debt written off and so on and so forth, so it, collection of different bad events. Again, more or less you have the same uh, parallel trends, but then the treatment group goes under after the law implementation. Two more graphs. Here we have number of 90 days past due occurrences. On, so it's like uh, a measure of uh, not so major de delinquency, but uh, like slightly less severe delinquency. Again, similar patterns. Um, when we have also a test of parallel trends, so basically we run the specification we, uh, and we do it on the pre-treatment data, so from data from Q1 2008 to Q1 2010, so we have this treatment indicator and we interact it with linear time trend uh, indicated by time, and we're interested if this coefficient delta 1 is statistically significant, so whether trends in the treatment control group before the treatment are statistically significantly different from each other. And what we find for all these measures of uh, financial distress we use in the paper, there is no statistically significant difference. So uh, let me talk about our main specification, which is very simple different if, but we have some, uh, we decided to split the post period into three periods. So why we decided to do it? So first we have this enactment period, so it's from Q2 2010 to Q3 2010 when some plans may start implementing the policy, but it's not required. Then we have implement period, which is from Q4 2010 to Q4 2012, which is when people are covered. And then we have period, which we call age out, when, which is from Q1 2013 to Q4 2013, 
when nobody is actually covered by this uh, policy. So that will allow us to see what happens after they age out from the coverage. Okay, we have a vector of control variables including state unemployment rates, county and insurance rates, uh, fixed effects, and so on and so forth. And the coefficients of interest are alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, so the coefficients in those three interaction terms. They indicate differences in financial distress between treatment and control group in each period. So this, very, this table summarizes just what we find, and in yellow we highlight what is statistically significant, also indicated with stars. So we find that, for example, for 90 days past due, we find the fact in enactment and in implementation, the reduction is 2% in enactment, 4% in implementation. I don't think I have time to go through all of them, but basically we find that there are statistically significant declines, uh, especially in enactment and implementation. Interestingly, in the age out period, uh, for most variables you don't have anything, any statistically significant effect, suggesting there is something going on in the age out. Also, so the first table was about the, you may think about the extensive margin, so if somebody has an account in the state or, uh, or, yeah, or collection or something like that. And the second table is about the intensive margin if like you have more debt, amount higher debt in collections or in uh, past due and so on and so forth. So for this, on average, we find zero effects basically. So that led us to believe that maybe there is a lot of heterogeneity in what's going on. And so that's what we you know, let's keep over this one. And that's what we decided to do. We just decided to look at different samples where one sample is uh, people, uh, and we use county level measure of uninsurance, young adult uninsurance, before the law implementation. So you may think about this group as uh, the group where a lot of people who might be treated, who can benefit from this policy, that's where they leave. So, and this high uninsurance rate, which is uh, uh, first panel is basically showing um, changes in financial distress variables for this group. So those who live in uh, counties with 75th or above percentile of uh, young adult insurance before the law implementation. And we see that most of the changes we find, most of the results are actually coming from this group. So you see it in 90 days past due, in major derogs, and you see it in bankruptcies and so on and so forth. Uh, so, this, uh, based on this finding, we decided to form a triple difference specification, and it's kind of similar to Mazander and Miller 2016 paper. Basically, we uh, have another indicator which says um, if somebody lives in a county uh, about the 71st percentile of young adult uninsurance and the state about the 71st percentile of young adult unemployment, this is a group where it really should matter a lot then this exposure variable would be equal to 1, otherwise it's 0. So we compare those two groups as well. And uh, the question is modified a bit, so uh, in addition to this interaction of treatment, and enactment, and implement age out, we interacted with this exposure variable as well. Uh, and so this is what we find with this triple uh, different specification. We find that actually the effects become stronger. So you, you can find effects in number of 90 days past due, in, uh, in uh, de uh, derogatory events, in third party collections, etc. And uh, the magnitudes are larger now as well. But interestingly to us, you can even find effects in these measures of amount in the state. So before, if you remember, it was all insignificant, but now you can find effects even in the amount of third party collections or amount past due. Uh, and the declines are pretty significant in economically and statistically. And the last thing we do is just uh, in this presentation is just the quantile regression. So uh, when you think about young adults as, as, as any other group, like who would benefit the most? Those who receive really bad, bad shocks where they have a lot of expenditures. And so uh, we think that average effects may actually mask that some people at the you know, right tail of the distribution of third party collections or amount of past use, they actually you know, seeing very large improvements, but when you take an average, it's like it's not, it's not there. So this one figure is for uh, amount in third party collections, and we see that uh, the largest effects actually on the at the 99th percentile, so here it's the red line, 
is statistically significant, which is indicated by uh, circles. Similar for amount of debt past due. So let me conclude here to allow Nathan to do his part. So we find that uh, the ACS dependent coverage <laughs> mandate reduced financial distress for young adults. We observe declines in various measures of uh, financial uh, distress, including serious delinquency, and we observe it in both the enactment and implementation periods. Effects are heterogeneous, large effects uh, in geographic areas with uh, higher prior young adult uninsurance and unemployment. We also observe an aging out effect in many variables when cohorts are no longer covered, so the effects then go away. Uh, and in terms of policy implications, now if you think about the debate going on in this area, the focus on cost of access uh, or excess in utilization of health care, but this may understate the benefits of providing health insurance coverage because there may be welfare enhancing benefits, financial benefits as found in this paper beyond just reduced out of pocket expenditures. Thank you. My name is Nathan Blaschek. I'll be doing the mop-up duty here since Slava did a really good job. Um, so, uh, once again, thanks to the organizers. So, after we got our results from this first paper, right, so we were able to uncover some pretty interesting, significant results in terms of health insurance coverage reducing financial distress for young adults, it kind of led us to ask some fairly logical follow-on questions. Uh, in regards to young adults and health insurance coverage. So, one, does health insurance coverage uh, allow young adults to change their borrowing behavior? So if it changes financial distress, we may logically ask, well, does it change, you know, how much borrowing are they going you know, to do? Or since maybe we think that there's less bad debt. And then the second question is, is like, if there are changes in borrowing, potentially if there are even increases in borrowing, would we expect to see changes in uh, consumption expenditures? So, Theoretically, it's unclear kind of where this, the directions for both consumption and uh, borrowing are going to go, particularly because it's um, a priori unclear how strong the income effect would be of receiving, of having lower out-of-pocket uh, medical expenditures and kind of how that would may, uh, allow young adults to increase, say, their borrowing consumption. And it's also unclear kind of the strength of the risk effect of having, medical, um, having health insurance protecting you from medical expenditure risk you know, uh, the strength of that, a little bit unclear, so it's unclear whether or not they would also have follow-on effects for um, consumption and, and borrowing. So, uh, the first part of the analysis, and I'm going to preview some very preliminary results of what we have, we're going to use the, the CCP data, the Individual Credit Bureau data, to look at borrowing uh, outcomes for these young adults, and then we're also going to bring in separately, in a separate analysis, uh, data from the Consumer Expenditure Survey from the BLS, and we're going to take a look at uh, consumption expenditures for young adults, and we're going to be using uh, the same identification strategy as Slava showed before. So really, it's just we're going to be doing kind of the same analysis, same identification strategy. We're going to be just looking at a different set of variables using the CCP, and then a different set of variables for consumption. So these are preliminary results, and so this is for the difference in difference uh, analysis. And what we can see here is is that for so what we can see is that kind of broadly across the board, we see very uh, small but statistically significant increases in, uh, in both uh, number of accounts, uh, revolving accounts and bank card accounts. So these are measures along the extensive margin for uh, borrowing. So we see that young adults, once they receive health insurance, actually increase the number of accounts that they have. And then we can see these last two uh, rows here. Uh, we see that young adults also increase the amount of debt that they carry uh, for bank card balances and the amount of non-delinquent debt that they have. Right? So it seems that not only do young adults, after they receive health insurance, not only do they increase the number of accounts that they have, they actually increase the amount of debt that they have on these accounts. So this is the CEX data. So this is using data from the Consumer Expenditure Survey. And so what we find here are some fairly reasonable, logical, maybe in terms of sign, but in terms of magnitude, uh, I'll discuss that in a minute. So we see quite large decreases in healthcare expenditures uh, in the implementation period for young adults. 
And in general, we kind of don't see too much with expenditures. It's uh, very, very noisy. But we do see something particularly interesting, which is in the age out period, a little bit in the implementation period, we, see, we do see significant increases in alcohol expenditures for young adults. So perhaps that's not surprising. And if anything, uh, it may be consistent with some research done by uh, Donald Dave at Bentley University, who used uh, some data from the, um, the time use survey that's part of uh, the CPS. And he found that young adults actually after the ACA's uh, dependent coverage mandate actually had more free time and they used that free time for more socializing. And so if young people, when they do more socializing, also consistently do more drinking, maybe we would expect that, but that's a bit of a tenuous connection to make, but uh, very much we will mention that here. So um, in conclusion, at least with these very preliminary results, and I want to stress that it's all very preliminary, that it does look like that along with reducing financial distress, offering health insurance to young adults also seems to allow them to increase the amount of borrowing that they do, as measured by, say, uh, increases in bank card balances. And it also looks like that they do increase some levels of consumption, or at least consumption expenditures. I know that that's very different when you think about consumption versus expenditures. Uh, we observe both increases so far in credit card borrowing along both the intensive and extensive margins. And we observe uh, this kind of really large decline in healthcare expenditures. And so one thing that I'll kind of point out now is that, like this number is extremely large right, so relative to the treated sample mean and the data that implies an like 60 and 70 percent decline. Um, what we find is, is that when you kind of take the CEX data and you kind of look at the distribution of health of um, healthcare expenditures. And so for the CEX, this is not actually restricted to just out of pocket. The question that they ask the CEX is just healthcare expenditures. So it's kind of hard to know if it's completely comprised out of, out of pocket or what that composition is. Um, that this is almost entirely driven by uh, young adults in the 90th and higher percentiles reducing the amount of their medical expenditures. So essentially la very large medical expenditure tickets. So if you were to take the CEX sample here and cut it and kind of essentially cut off people at the 90th percentile or above and focus on just smaller amounts, this effect is very small and insignificant. So there's almost no effect on people kind of in the mass of the distribution of healthcare expenditures. So it's very primarily driven by young adults with very high medical expenditures, which I think is what we would expect with the kind of protections that health insurance would provide, that it would kind of prevent young adults from incurring extremely large uh, amounts of, of uh, expenditures in uh, medical care. And so it seems like the implication so far is that access to health insurance is going to affect uh, borrowing household spending for young adults. Uh, previously, maybe we wouldn't have expected this. Young adults, once again, it's hard to really know whether or not how sensitive they would be to, say, the income effect and the risk effect of health insurance coverage. And so then, as Slava alluded to, um, this is these two papers on the ACA are kind of just a large, just a, a, a small part of a larger uh, program that we're trying to develop at the Philadelphia Fed. Um, so we're doing a lot of work right now, kind of thinking about the uh, financial impact of uh, both, uh, you know, um, health policy changes and health insurance coverage expansions. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're thinking about looking at next is the effect of the ACA's dependent coverage mandate, looking at uh, student loan borrowing, whether or not this reduction in medical expenditure, uh, medical expenditure risk may spur on uh, investment in human capital. Um, we have a project that's kind of far along now looking at actually the opposite, which is um, a, pub a, a public health insurance program rollback in Missouri in 2005 that particularly hit hard the disabled population. We're going to try to see whether or not the reduction of public health benefits, uh, what kind of financial effects that's going to be. Um, I, have, I have a project in initial stages looking at the effects of Medicaid coverage in youth or in childhood on financial outcomes and whether or not gaining public insurance coverage um, very early on in life may have uh, effects in improving financial outcomes. We know that the literature has already shown there's improvements in both health and in uh, human capital accumulation for Medicaid coverage in childhood. So maybe we would expect financial outcomes to improve as well. And I also have another paper that's looking at the effect of hospital billing regulations in California on financial outcomes. And in particular, some new data that we're interested in using, which is on uh, medical debt and third party collections. And so uh, that's it, and thank you. <laughs>
Um, so I, I'd like to take this opportunity, I think on behalf of all of us, uh, to thank the uh, local organizers uh, for this uh, incredible conference. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, the venue, the restaurant we had uh, yesterday, which is absolutely uh, gorgeous. So let me thank uh, Philippe Dastou, uh, who was there, uh, David Boisclair, and Lee Boyle, who's also uh, outside, who were incredible in the logistics. I'd also like to thank uh, people from CR and also from uh, RSI for financing this. Uh, so thanks uh, to, to all of you. Uh, so on behalf of everybody. <laughs> Okay, I have to admit, I didn't expect to have the two co-authors uh, in front of me, so I might tone down a bit the, the comments. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, so here's the idea. Uh, so, uh, here is a very short, uh, a short overview. So, uh, what do we know about kids, uh, you know, I wouldn't say kids, uh, but young adults? Uh, first of all, they're not that rich. Uh, they're facing extremely volatile uh, income. Uh, which is also low, and they're usually uninsured. So that's a couple of things that we know. So uh, they are prone to uh, financial distress. That's the thing we know. And what uh, DCM did after 2010 is say, look, uh, your parents have to pay for part of this. Uh, so uh, before that, people were you know, not that insured. After that, they're going to be unconditionally insured through their parents uh, up to age uh, 26. Okay, So you have you know, a nice... Uh, a setting for a natural experiment, which is okay, I'm going to do a diff and diff here comparing two groups. Uh, first of all, uh, those would be treated are, are the eligible agents uh, you know, before 26 in 2010, and the control are those that are not uh, eligible. So those would be aged, say, 27 to 28 uh, in 2010, if we omit the 26 uh, uh, age. So, the idea over here is to look at the effect of DCM on financial distress of young adults. And that's the uh, essence of the first paper that was presented by, by Sava. And that's the one I, I got to, to come at. Okay. So the, uh, there's two underlying assumptions which are, are fairly straightforward. So the idea is that uh, at least part of the financial distress is going to come from the fact that you are facing uninsured out-of-pocket expenditures related to uh, medical expenses. So if I introduce mandated uh, insurance, then that's easy. I'm reducing that exposure, so therefore there should be less financial distress. Okay, so that's the overall uh, uh, conceptual idea that we have over here. And what they do find is that indeed uh, financial distress, at least for certain measures of financial distress, uh, is, is going down uh, after you introduce uh, the DCM. Now what they also show uh, which I, I think is interesting is that financial distress is going up afterwards. So it's only a temporary effect. Uh, so it's not going to be uh, all that long lasting. And especially that effect is strong if you look at the more distressed of the distressed. Uh, so that would be true. Uh, and it's, the effect is stronger if you look at low uh, socioeconomic status uh, counties, okay, which they use as a proxy uh, for individual uh, SES uh, measures. Okay. So uh, here's my first comment. The first comment is, you know, to what extent are uh, these people subject to this risk of high uh, health expenses? So the first thing I did is, okay, I'll look at their actual health status. So here I have three, three, me three measures. The first one is uh, fair, uh, those people who report fair or poor health and self-reported uh, health status. Uh, and those who that report any lim limitation with daily activities and those that have serious health conditions, so things like diabetes and, and so on, okay? And you can see that's the life cycle of your health, basically. So here are the young people, and you can see, you know, as was admitted, uh, these are fairly healthy people uh, overall, okay? Things are going to start going uh, down the drain, especially uh, around middle age, and afterwards, you know, it just goes worse from worse to, uh, from bad to worse. Okay, so the first thing is that they're not that unhealthy uh, when they are young. Uh, so how does this translate to actual expenses? Uh, uh, here uh, you have uh, data that comes from uh, Medicare and also Medicaid. And here's the tranche uh, that we are looking at. So what do we see? Uh, first of all, so these are uh, averages. I'll come to, uh, to medians uh, in a second. But you could see out-of-pocket is over here. So about you know, 500 bucks uh, per year. So that, that's not you know, huge amount. Of course, these are mean. That doesn't mean that you don't, you're not facing catastrophic uh, expenses. But on average, you know, it, it's, not, it's not that huge. 
And even if I you know, control for uh, who's the payer uh, of this, so in total, what we have over here, this is what I was telling you. you know, the bulk of the action is going to come more as you reach middle age and afterwards, but not so much with that age group. So you know, the first thing that we could say is that, you know, is it really that bad in terms of uh, health expenses? Uh, this is uh, maybe a bit small. This is uh, MEPS data. Uh, and in fact, it's looking exactly at 2010, which is the year that they're looking at. So uh, you have people who are uh, below 25 years, and then those who are uh, after 25, 25 to 30 over here. The first thing to notice is that a lot of people uh, do not report actual expenses. So, you know, either they're not sick or, you know, they just don't report uh, in the data. So. And this is the, the largest group, in fact, uh, that don't report any expenses. And when they do, uh, the expenses are, are not that much. So first thing, you, you, you can have a, a sense, uh, if you compare the mean and the median uh, over here, you can see the median is much lower. So it's true that there are some expenses that are going to be catastrophic in nature. And that's the thing you want to insure against. So definitely, you know, agree about it. But given this, the out-of-pocket percentage that you pay is between 15 and 20%. So you know it's it's not immense uh, for sure. So the question is, is this, is this really one of the major causes of financial distress? Okay. So what what do I get out of this? Uh, here's the here's the, the idea is that these people are healthy uh, and they're, they're pretty much at the highest level in terms of their health and their life cycle. After that, it's going to be going down. But at this age, you know they're pretty healthy. There's a bunch that don't have any expenses at all. Of course, there's no excuse for assuming that there's no expenses and especially we saw that the mean is much larger than the median which suggests that you know some of these expenses are going to be pretty bad so that's good but you know in terms of financial distress i can think of other things that could be probably more more important in particular things like early mortgage that that that, that you are taking and early in your life uh, the durable goods that you buy you know these new pickup trucks and, and so on uh, things like tuition fees that you're going to start to have to, to pay back or consumer credit. Uh, so definitely these are, you know, uh, on the debt part. But also what we know is that the wages are low and they're quite volatile. These are people that are most exposed to unemployment. Uh, so definitely these elements would be, you know, the first things I would look at in terms of financial distress. Perhaps more uh, than, um, than uh, medical expenses. In other words, it's not clear to me that you know, if you're going to be insured against uh, medical expenses, that's going to be a huge contributor to your, uh, to your financial distress. Okay, so, but then again, let's suppose we do accept this, this notion, so we have to think about the theory. Uh, and I'm more from the theoretical part uh, of things, so you know, that's the part I like mo uh, most. So what's the idea? Um, what they are doing is say, OK, you're exposed to some form of medical expenses risk. And basically, uh, what they're going to look at is how this translates to this part, which is financial risk uh, in the next period. And reducing that exposure you know, should improve things with uh, respect to, to, uh, to financial risk over here. Of course, you have the choices that you make uh, in, in between that are going to be the main determinant of what's going to happen uh, afterwards, in particular, you know, given uh, some insurance that, that occurs here, this is going to affect all these variables over here. So, and here, they, you know, they need to work out a bit more what is the theoretical impact. Moreover, you know, these effects are not going to stop here. Uh, these are long-lasting, and they, they should last pretty long over the life cycle. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, you know, if I'm, I'm insured, this is going to have some moral hazard effect that I'll be talking about. That's going to change my exposure to future risk that I, I really need to, to take into account. In other words, you know, doing this from here to there is fine, but presumably what you want to do is to look you know, further down the line uh, on the life cycle uh, and to see why these, uh, these elements uh, are going to be uh, important. So let's suppose we go through these effects. What would those be? So uh, as was mentioned, the first one is going to be through the budget constraints. So the first one, you're facing a lower premium. Uh, so yeah, in a way, I'm richer. That's true. Uh, and I'm less exposed to medical bill, uh, high medical bill exposure. So that, that, that's fine. You know, that's also a wealth effect. But then there's a moral hazard thing. So I'm changing the price of curative versus uh, preventive care. And other research that we did, we show you know this can have a big impact. Uh, in particular, I'm going to start uh, cutting down on preventive care, uh, which is going to lead to further problems down the line. Uh, okay, so that could be uh, important. It's going to affect future morbidity and also mortality risk exposure, which are you know big conditions 
big conditioners on the financial choices uh, that you want to make. Uh, also, if you, you, know, you take this from a background risk uh, perspective, if I reduce background risk, what people do is that they take on more risk elsewhere. Uh, so you know, that's a, a possibility. possibility. Uh, so in particular, you know, I'm going to take less precautionary savings over here. I don't have to do it, which is going to make me more vulnerable to future shocks, for instance, uh, income shocks afterwards. Uh, also, uh, you know, I'm removing the employer insurance job logs. So the, the fact that you know previously I had to find an employer who would provide me uh, some plans, some insurance plans. Now it's my parents' insurance plans that kicks in. So I'm remo removing that lock over here. So with, what does it mean? It means probably I could search more. You know, take more of my time to try to shop around, find an employer because now my parents' insurance is covering the. Uh, uh, the, the, my parents' plan discovery. So this is going to lead to more volatile income. Uh, finally, you know, from a family, intra-family allocation perspective, you know, I'm shifting that burden to my parents. So you know, they might retaliate in some, uh, some way <laughs> by cutting down on bequests or food or whatever. Uh, so you know, there could be some of these elements. I guess the main point is that to me, there's no direct link, which is self-evident, that uh, health insurance is absolutely has to have an impact. So if, you know, I'm willing to buy this idea up to a certain point, but you, you would have to, to work a bit more on the theory uh, to, to explain me through which channel this should go. So that should be important. Okay, so let's go on the data. Um, so we don't know uh, the sources of debt. So where is the debt coming from? Is it secure debt? Is it unsecured debt? It would have been nice to have some, some information on, on this. Also, more important is that there's no individual information on socioeconomic status uh, variable. I don't know education, I don't know income, uh, wealth or gender. And of course, these are going to be you know, strong determinant of decisions and of, of future outcomes afterwards. Uh, now, this is proxied by you know, county and state level aggregates. You know, that's fine. Uh, but it, it's a bit problematic because you know, in the XIT over here, the I is is not I, so, so that, that could be a problem. There is one exception, which is credit score, but that you only use this in, in, in table 10, at least in the version. So I guess the main point is that this is weakly accounting for sources of, of personal heterogeneity. Uh, so, so that could be a bit problematic over here. Now, uh, the treatment, as you mentioned, this is uh, intended, intent to treat uh, type of analysis, that's fine. Uh, is that why you find no effects on many of the dependent variables? Because you're not sure that, you know, I am eligible. It doesn't mean I will take this program, obviously. Uh, so that could be uh, an element. Also, we can think about other explanations for these type of effects. Uh, you know, if I compare 24 to 27, you know, in my case, the big thing was my kids arrived. So, you know, I, I sort of become an adult at 27 that I certainly wasn't at 24. Uh, so you're facing responsibility that you don't have before, and you're really comparing these two groups. You know, things change uh, over this life cycle over here. So maybe you want to consider other age group pairs that could be uh, feasible. Now, another point is uh, business cycle. So 2010 is a bit special if you look at the labor market. That's really the moment when, first of all, unemployment peaks. Uh, before that, you know, it starts going up, and then poof, it, it just shoots up in 2010. Uh, moreover, uh, if you look at the spread uh, between people who are 20 to 24 and those that are 25 to 34, the spread, which is fairly even, so just the difference between unemployment rates between the two groups, it just shoots up uh, in 2010. So in other words, uh, that group is hit a lot harder by the big recession uh, than uh, the, the older group. Maybe this is helping you in a sense. Uh, I, I haven't figured that out, but there's certainly something from the business cycle perspective that says, you know, after 2000, in 2010, it's a bit of a special year. So you might want to consider, you know, alternative years uh, as well. Now, uh, about econometrics now. Um, what we have is bina some binary data. For instance, uh, do we have new, uh, you know, DPD occurrence, new third party? That's, you know, binary. Uh, then you have count data, the number of DPD, number of uh, derogatory, uh, which suggests some Poisson uh, estimator. The other one would be probit or logit, obviously. And then you have continuous data, like the amount of debt, uh, which suggests something like GLS uh, over here. Okay, fine. Uh, you seem to be going, so I, I didn't see any information in the paper, at least, as which uh, estimator you, you were really using. But I, presumably that's important. 
Now, what I would suggest is to go multivariate uh, instead of you know single equation uh, estimation. I, it seems clear to me that the errors should be correlated, which could help you uh, in pumping up the, these t-stats uh, at the end. That's something that you, you might want to, to do. Uh, now, also, if you really want to you know mix everything over there, uh, then you might want to consider some kind of, of mixture model, but that might be a bit too much. Uh, so this is my last figure. See, and I only have 16 seconds. Um, about so here are a few suggestions on top of that. Uh, personal heterogeneity. That's you know what we do in macro uh, when we don't have enough data. Uh, we just use lag data. So why don't you do this over here? Uh, so you could use lag uh, variables, lag dependent variables uh, in your your conditioning set. Uh, if you it, you know what I would do is use the entire set. Just you instead of using one by one, I would use the, the entire set of dependent variables that you have. You lag them and you increase them as we go. Also, it seems to be a natural gradation uh, in measures of distress over here. So you can see, you know, this is going to appear first, then you move to the 120 day, and so on and so on. In other words, you might want to consider an ordered probit or logit uh, estimator instead of, you know, just doing this as, as though these were uncorrelated. Uh, finally, uh, this is more, you know, from my macro uh, perspective, you might want to consider more dynamic alternatives rather than a diff and diff as other uh, safety check that you do over here. So, you know, things like panel probit, panel GLS, or, or even a VAR if you want, uh, would be uh, a way to link, you know, uh, bankruptcy prob uh, probability to, to things that have happened uh, in the past. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll stop here. So. Uh, so thanks for letting me do it. Yes. Thanks, Pascal. And do you guys want to take questions or answer back? Um, maybe just a quick clarification in terms of who pays. Uh, so, I mean, it depends on how, like, uh, uh, parents, uh, whether they have other kids or not. But in many cases, these parents wouldn't even pay anything because if they have younger kids, uh, the plans may be just like adults plus family or family plans, so you can you know add your dependent without paying uh, for 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 anything. So that may change this you know interfamily conflict or whatever. <laughs> Nathan, maybe you want to respond. Yeah. Now there the comments are excellent. I mean, some of these ideas we definitely have thought about before, and some things that we've thought about implementing, and perhaps we should try a little bit harder to to do that. Um, I think you said something in particular. Um, so, like one of the things that we're not concerned about is some of the labor outcomes for these people. Like, uh, our, the co uh, my co-author and good friend on the second paper has already shown that job lock wasn't uh, reduced due to the ACA's dependent coverage mandate. So, we're pretty sure that um, that's not a source of what's going on. But um, I do think maybe thinking about some of these other kinds of effects and maybe trying to be a little bit more clear on what the mechanism is and teasing apart those a little bit more and some kind of decomposition I think would maybe be able help strengthen our argument that this is indeed operating, this is a channel in which this can operate. Um, but yeah, no, I think most of it was excellent, so thank you. Um, let me raise another pathway that I didn't hear you discuss but I think is, is, is much discussed and is playing a role here. A key provision of the Affordable Care Act, apart from allowing uh, children under the age of 26 to be part of the parents' plan, was the Medicaid expansion. So there was a massive Medicaid expansion to the non-elderly, which basically means people not on Medicaid, Medicare. So it's 64. It's actually up to 64, <laughs> which is kind of nice. Um, and that is really interesting in many ways because. Uh, there was selective adoption by states. As we know, the asshole Republican states didn't adopt it. So you've actually got a really nice uh, treatment, like Georgia, for example. Um, so you've got 31 states, I think it was, that accepted that and others that don't. So you've actually got, if you've got state data, a really nice set of covariates to put in we, there. We, we got beat to it. Yeah, so somebody else. Someone at the CFPB. Oh, okay. Well, you wouldn't, my point is you shouldn't be ignoring it. If you don't seem to be, I'm fine that someone did it. But you shouldn't ignore that because a lot of your story is about the uptake to 26, which is interesting, but this one has expansions beyond 26. It's not just people up to the age of 26. Um, and it also has other implications, and that is uh, that somebody is paying for this. Now, I think this is a, overall a wonderful and welfare-enhancing thing, so don't get me wrong. But if, if Medicaid is paying, then you've got to deal with the marginal excess burden of raising taxes to pay for that. 
And so it's been paid for by the feds, even though the states administer it. So one has to worry about that. The other thing that I think is very, very important to recognize here that makes this maybe even more important is if you look at the MEPS data, for example, which is the correct source here to look at initially, out-of-pocket expenditures if people that have private, expense, private insurance are about the same as out-of-pocket expenditures, payments I'm only looking at now, for people that are uninsured. Part of that is because the uh, uninsured are included in what's called bad debt and charity care by hospitals. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's sort of, they're there, but particularly catastrophic stuff. Um, and also, of course, hospitals will work mightily for the catastrophic stuff to get people declared medically indigent. So they're very good at sucking up the money if, if you're coming in for intensive care for like six months. So that's a separate, separate issue. But you've got to be very careful. The people that have extremely low out-of-pocket are people on public, Medicaid, Medicare, Champa, VA, and so forth. So they're dramatically low. So here's my point. If people are going from being uninsured to being privately insured through their parents, it's not obvious, according to the MEPS data, that out-of-pocket payments are actually changing. So that suggests that it's not so much the parents' substitution as the Medicaid expansion. That's a hypothesis. That's just sort of, I'm just saying, it makes that more of an interesting hypothesis to contrast with the, the mechanism you're talking about. That's all. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point to think about it a little bit more. Because, um, yeah, it's because the, the dependent coverage mandate in particular operates through a mandate on private insurance. Right. Um, it is, like I guess uh, the first part of what you were saying is, um, you know, like the, I think the big question comes in is that, so the incidents on the parents and the parents' plan. And so then what happens to, say, ESI for premiums and what's the pass-through um, if there are increased premiums onto right. other people, it's the kind of thing about what the incidence is. And, and there's so another welfare benefit, and that is there was a sharp reduction in bad debt and charity care, not surprisingly, because people would be covered by parents. And that has tremendous benefits in terms of the hospitals because that's just oh, yes. a pure debt weight cost. Um, <coughs> the final thing to note, sorry, is that one has to be, like I said earlier, you have to be very careful in the US to distinguish between charges and payments. Triple, triple check that you're looking at payments because charges are, are, are nonsense except when you're dealing with the uninsured, because they don't have someone negotiating their rates now. So for the uninsured, one of the benefits here is, even if you're out of pocket expenditure of such and such because you're uninsured, if you're suddenly on private care uh, or Medicaid, guess what, someone's negotiated rates down for you. So you could have a reduction purely because you've suddenly got someone who's negotiating the difference between charges and payments. That's still a benefit, but the mechanism is a little bit different. Yeah. That's all.